Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm alcoholic. Hello. Oh, I'm grateful to be here. The microphone's kind of tripping me out a little bit. I haven't... Um, the first time I spoke when I had, and I got sober in New York, and um, for your 90 days, when you complete your 90 and 90, you speak, and I signed up, and it was a big meeting, like 150 people, and there was a big, it seemed a much bigger at the time, microphone. Um, and, uh, yeah, I haven't, um, I haven't spoken in, in quite some time. Uh, Jamie asked me to speak a while ago, weeks ago, and I totally spaced it. We had a family dinner tonight. And um, I'm getting in the car to come here, and I realize I don't even know where the church is because I've been here once a really long time ago. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I had a baby about eight weeks ago, so I'm a breastfeeding mom, and I don't have the little pads that catch your milk. So um, I'm like, I have this vision of, like, dripping wet, total manager. I'm late, you know, and I'm not going to show. So, um, yeah, so I'm still like, what's going to come out? I don't even know what's going to come out of my mouth. So, uh, which is great because, you know, given the time, I would have like, you know, I tried to have some story. At least that's what I used to do when I'd speak off. And so I got sober in New York back in um, uh, 2003. My sober date's March of 2003. And um, my group here is Magnolia. We meet on Thursday nights. And um uh, when we, where we get sober, we have booking meetings, or where I got sober in New York, we have booking meetings, and so, um, I did my 90 and 90, and after your 90 meetings, you go quarterly to this meeting, and you sign up to speak at different home groups, and so you're always bringing freshness into the meetings, and there's, uh, you know, I'd speak three or four times a month, and it was really great, and it's been some time, uh, since I've had a half hour to talk, really, um, so I'll see what I can, I can do here, um, so, um, yeah, you know, I uh, I got sober in 2003. I, I took my first drink when I was 12. Um, and, you know, for me and what I heard in the last speaker, which I hear often at an, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, is that um, it worked, you know. And for me, I took a drink, and it was like the last puzzle piece, like something just, like, smoothed over, and I was a little bit looser, and I was like, oh, yeah, that feels good. You know, I knew about alcoholism, um, I, like many of us, I come from a long line of pretty signif- pretty serious, real alcoholics. You know, if we're not close to dead and still drinking, we're sober or in the ground. You know, it's kind of, there's not really a middle-of-the-road um, alcoholic in my family. Um, we're all pretty sick. And, um, you know, so I knew about alcoholism, but I didn't know, um, I don't know, I had a different idea about what alcoholism was, and I can tell you that I didn't think I had it for sure. And certainly the warm, fuzzy feeling that the, al- that the drink gave me couldn't possibly be alcoholism. Um, and uh, at my sister's wedding, my father had told me, hey, kid, you know, it takes one to know one, and I think you got it, you know. And, and in fact, you know, that wasn't the first time I drank, but that was a pretty significant blackout in my life where I remember, like, coming to the next day and going, oh, yeah, that was fun. What happened, you know? And I didn't know at that time that blackouts weren't normal. And um, it wasn't, um, honestly, it wasn't until I got to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I actually found out what alcoholism was and what I suffered from. So I once heard this guy say, like, um, you know, one solution for, like, an overheating engine is to drive it into the lake. You know, that's a sure way to cool off your engine. And I was like, yeah, right, totally. But it doesn't fix the problem. You know, the problem is like a bad water heater or something, a water pump or a thermostat. So um, so what I was told uh, when I got to AA that you need to know what the problem is um, in order to find a solution. And um, for a long time, I didn't know. Um, like it talks about, you know, in the big book, it says like, often many like many times you'll ask and they don't they don't know an alcoholic doesn't know why they drank and I had a lot of good reasons and a lot of good ideas about maybe why um but I really at that time had no idea and I learned here it's because I'm alcoholic I have you know the physical compulsion after I start to drink and the mental obsession and I can't stop and I never knew that's what happened you know I never knew that's what was going on in my body after I drank so um 
you know, there's a lot of details in there. I can tell you that it's probably just like you're drinking. Um, I, I drank. Um, I wanted to drink more. Um, it, you know, a long time was a, a solution for me. Um, and then it really stopped working. Um, you know, what became, you know, what the ease and comfort that came when I drank soon was, you know, was substituted with the, the, the terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. Oh. And I, I made a lot of decisions um, early on in my life around um, alcohol and around the scene. Um, I ended up in various parts of the world. I ended up down in the Keys for a minute. I was like three years sober speaking when I real I said, well, I'm not, and I was never homeless, but I looked in a tent and everyone laughed and I was like, and and the thing was that's the thing was is that I was in fact homeless. And I was three years sober until I was like, oh 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 yeah, that was homelessness as a result of my alcoholism, you know. And if you had asked me, I was going to tell you it's, I chose to live in a tent because I couldn't afford an apartment. And so <laughs> so it was really it was kind of thick. I needed a lot of um, redirection when I got to AA, a lot. Um, and uh, <laughs> so by the time, uh, you know, by the, towards the end of my drinking, you know, we'll go right to the bottom, um, I, had, uh, I, had, I had my first meeting off of, I was trying to, I was living with my brother at the time, and, um, well, you know, yeah, there's a lot of details in there. Anyway, I ended up at a, me a clubhouse down in Florida, because there's lots of clubhouses there. Happened to be a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And I sat down, and I sat across, and I looked up, and there was this guy. God bless him. He became a very good friend of mine. And he's bald, right, and white hair just on the sides and, like, hardly any teeth. <clears throat> and he said, if you want what we got, and I thought, hell no. Whatever it is that you caught, I was terrified, right? I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I've, I've done drugs. I've done a lot of drugs. Um, and I didn't want that, you know. <laughs> I was like, um, I don't think I belong here, but my brother really needs help. That's why I was there. Um, and they were like, keep coming back, kid, you know. Um, and so that was, um, like, I kind of, that was like a little start of like, maybe we're not doing that well, my brother and I. And maybe we should put some stuff down. Um, but uh, towards the end, there, I had a moments, periods of not drinking, um, like nothing long. I'm talking under a month. You know, I, I couldn't even count that high um, at that time in my life. And um, I ended up in a blackout. There was at my job. I was drinking on the job, and um, there's lots of money gone. I woke up next to somebody I didn't know. Like, I couldn't find my car. My, you know, my dog's, like, hasn't been out in days. The house is, you know, at this time I was in a studio, the house, the studio apartment I was living in. Um, was it was trashed and I got a call um, from my boss. I was like, what happened here last night? You know, and I was man. Well, this is his first mistake. I was bar manager of a big restaurant down on the beach when I was 20 years old. I'm not sure what he was thinking. Actually, I do I know exactly what he was thinking. And um, <laughs> I always thought that was like job security, sleeping with your boss. As it turns out, it's not. And um, I was fired. Uh, and uh, I told you I didn't know what, was, what parts were going to come out here tonight. And um, yeah, I ended up in a, psych a lockdown psychiatric unit. And I knew that um, when they shut the door, oh, <laughs> they shut the door, and I was in the chair, and I went to go slide it over to the desk, and it wouldn't move, right? And it was nailed to the it was screwed to the ground. And I thought, oh, and then a pair of paper slippers hit my shoulder, and they're like, here, put these on. And I was like, oh no, right? Just this sinking feeling. I was like, this, I'm done, right? And so I spent some time in there, and um, I came out um, I came out a lot sicker, believe it or not, than when I went in, because they give me a lot of drugs in there. And they put, came out, I came out on a lot of drugs in there. And it didn't, that stuff didn't work for me either. And um, anyway, I got back to New York, long, long story, even longer. Um, and I, I, uh, I got willing to go to a meeting, and so I went to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and I was the really sad newcomer at 20 years old that raised her hand and spoke for 20 minutes at an open discussion meeting. And, um, and I'm like, if that were to happen, I was, I would be like, honey, stop. 
are you talking? You know, and they didn't. It was a noon meeting, you know, and they let me rant. I don't know what they were thinking, but this woman came up to me after the meeting. She said, I'm going to be your sponsor. And I was like, oh, boy. Right. And um, and so, you know, she's still, you know, she's still with me. It's been like almost 13 years. We've been in and out, but nonetheless, she's been a very solid structure. Probably the first real relationship I can tell you I've ever had in my life is has been with this woman. And so she started to um, open up the doors to recovery for me. And um, she opened up the doors, you know, and then she um, gently guided me through them is what happened. And I, um, I finally started going to meetings regularly um, because I can tell you um, prior to that, the two years prior to that, in and out of, you know, meetings and no step work, well, I'll do this step, and I don't want a sponsor, but he could be my sponsor. I could do that, and I'm not going to write an inventory. All this, all this stuff, all the ideas that I had, you know, about um, what alcoholism was, what the program of recovery was, what I was, what I was capable of doing, what I needed to do, because clearly I was too smart. I didn't really belong here. The list goes on and on, right? We all have it, right? I, I remember my father saying, you know, kid, um, I've never seen anyone too stupid. They couldn't get this, but I've seen a lot of people way too smart. And um, I thought, oh, really? It's really that, it's really like that. And he's like, yeah, it's that simple. It really is, you know? And um, and that's what I found. It, it really is, you know? Um, uh, you know, it's it's definitely challenging at times, you know, it, and there has been uh, um, quite a few challenges in my sobriety, but um, I found that to be, that's pretty much blanket truth for me. You know, like, if I can dumb it down a little, the better off I am in sobriety. You know, I don't need to figure anything out. I don't have to have the answers. There's lots of other people that can help me with that. Oh. So, about my sobriety and my journey in recovery, um, and what it's been like in the steps, I mean, uh, it's really been a trip. I can tell you that I'm a lot more... I'm a lot longer sober now than I ever spent in my act of alcoholism, you know. And so for that, I should have some stuff to talk about, um, um, and w which I do. And I, I think my experience is um, in early recovery is that may, perhaps the one, th the one thing I did that followed the program, which was don't drink. That's maybe the one, that is the one thing that I did without fail. And I went to meetings, you know. Um, I was all into fellowship. I was... Just about to turn 21 years old, um, I moved back to New York with nothing, a bottle of lithium, two black garbage bags, and I was totally out of my mind, right? And, um, uh, yeah, and so I started going to meetings, and, um, like, wildly inappropriate probably doesn't even start to describe <laughs> what I, you know, what I was like for people. Um, <laughs> in fact, at my seventh anniversary, this guy was like, you, I remember you, you were so inappropriate, and I started to get so angry, you know, and he's like, and what a beautiful young lady you are, and I was like, okay, you know, uh, now it's weird, and, um, but that's what it was, I was incredibly inappropriate, um, you know, I had really inappropriate jobs, go figure, um, I was driven, driven by fear and self-centeredness, I had no idea, you know, I was told, um, and you start going through the book, and you're looking at the book, and, you know, they, you're talking about, my sponsor spent a lot of time, like, I, I started off, um, speaking about what the problem is, and, um, and then what the solution is, you know, and there was no middle of the road. You know, she told me it was about finding a relationship with God and getting through these steps so I could have an ex a spiritual experience that I didn't have to drink anymore. And um, I wasn't, like, I didn't come here to get spiritual. I was, like, I didn't have any, like, um, you know, resentment or the religion or the God thing. I was just like, okay, I can do it, but next, can we keep going here? Like, what, you know, what else do I need to do? And she was like, this is it. You need to find a relationship with God. And all the stuff that was in between uh, me and the the God of my understanding was this, like, fear, resentment, self-centeredness, self-loathing, pity, greed, all of it. And I had no idea. And I believed her enough to start to continue with the program, but I didn't quite, like, jump all in, you know? And so as I was, like, I was like, I can do the fellowship thing in the meetings because maybe I'll run into a guy I like. That would be really cool and make something happen. And that was, like, so, um, so, but I so I went to meetings. And then 
Um, when I was a year and a half sober, my brother that I was living with in, um, in Key West ended up killing himself from alcoholism. And um, it crushed me. It absolutely crushed me. I can't even describe to you um, the, uh, the bottom that, you know, and the darkness that befell on me. And so uh, I'm a year and a half without a drink. I barely have the steps in my life. I mean, I'm like doing them, but I don't have any sober experience. Don't, I don't have much sober experience. And, um, and I, then I was about to have my first real spiritual experience where I was sitting on my couch, clearly remember this, and um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm just writhing in pain and guilt and, gosh, it was, it was, it was terrible. And um, so I'm, I'm sure you can all imagine. And I got up and I got my car and I was like, I'm going to drink. I'm, I haven't had a drink in a year and a half. I'm, I'm thirsty, you know, give me, I want to drink. And so I, and I know it's because I went to a meeting every day. I, and it was a Wednesday night. I ended up in a step meeting um, in a church basement. And this guy, Russ, I couldn't stand, couldn't stand him, right? He was always like the sober voice I would hear in my head when I'm like totally acting out and, and totally inappropriate. I'd be in like some bizarre circumstance and I'd hear Russ. And I was like, and, and what happened? And so I ended up in this meeting, right? And I, I got in the car to go drink and then I thought I'd just kill myself. And then I, so I end up in this meeting and, and he's up there, he's talking and, and he said, you know, if you're under five years of sobriety, um, and you're thinking about killing yourself, you call it what it is, call it murder and not suicide because you have no idea who you are. You know, if you haven't, like, if you don't have a chunk yet here, you just don't know. And for the first time, it, like, because I, I, probably because I was so broken at that moment, let, like, grace was able to slip in, and I believe this man. I was like, maybe he's right. What if he's right, you know, and if that's the case, I'm ready to throw it all away, and I have, I don't even know. I, I don't even have the slightest idea. What if everything I know is not true? Um, and that, in fact, was the case. Most of everything I knew at that time in my life wasn't true, you know, and I had been running my life based on these lies, and of course my outcome was... Um, unhealthy, you know, because I'm making decisions based on stuff that actually isn't true for me anymore. And so, um, so that was like a real big turning point in my sobriety, um, uh, where I really started to like take sobriety seriously and be like, all right, I can, maybe I can do this, you know, maybe Russ, maybe he's right. And maybe if I just take some steps and I stick it out, like I'll get to know and I'll, I'll find some, a solution, you know, I'll find some relief. And so, um, you know, I can't tell you how AA and my sponsor carried me through that time in my life. Um, and like grace, you know, this relationship I had been trying to build with my, um, with a God of my understanding, um, you know, but I got through and I wasn't. And so, so my, my brother died on the fifth and on the 10th, this young, crazy girl, young, crazy newcomer, just like myself, was like, will you sponsor me? And I thought, oh, my God. And my sponsor's like, you better, you know, you have no choice. And so, and what happened, and so, and I'm, like, burying my brother. It was the day I, like, buried my brother, and that, here's this crazy newcomer. And um, and so I sponsored her. And <laughs> I had been through the steps. I was still really sick, but it was incredibly, I mean, she also may have, in fact, saved my sobriety. I mean, it was a really great experience, and, you know, I... I'm I, I'm certain that everything happens just as it's supposed to. And she walked into my life. You know, I I don't know where she is now or what she's doing, but um, you know, it certainly was a great experience for me. Um, and so so yeah, so that was a really big turning point in my recovery. Um, the other thing that I can talk about um, that I heard when I was about five years sober, which was like another big kind of shift for me. Um, was this woman who sponsored me for a minute and she had said, you know, like feeling good is not a motivation for right action, but a byproduct of right living. And it took me a couple years, right? Cause that's a mouthful. It's a head full. And it took me some time to understand what she was talking about. But, you know, I started really working on that and there was a, a, a again, a, a, a slow, subtle, yet very powerful change that took place in my life where I started to lose less and less of myself. You know, and that's, of course, what the promise is and what the book talks about, you know, um, you know, being more available for others and for service rather than thinking about me all the time. And I can tell you at that time in my life, I was very involved in AA, um, 
I had started this, I had started this, some of us had started um, a young people's meeting. I got, re we got really involved. It got really big, really quick, you know, and um, I was so self-righteous and so uh, all-knowing about a principles and um, what everyone needed, to, who was going to stay sober and who wasn't. I mean, I was incredibly <laughs> arrogant. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and you know I'm, I'm so I'm involved with these young people. I have like the longer some of the I'm like an old timer in my meeting, which is ridiculous, and um, you know um, I didn't really need a whole lot of help up on the soapbox. I mean I was sponsoring a ton of women, where I was like super involved. There was a ton of fellowship. People were at our house all the time with big bonfires and stuff. It was really like very nostalgic time in recovery. It was great, um, you know. But in hindsight, I can tell you like I didn't. Somebody should have kicked me off the soapbox a long, long time ago, and um, or at least not boost help boost me up there. You know, I, and I, I certainly didn't need any help. And you know, I kind of came out of that era of my sobriety, um, or that began. That era kind of ended when this woman had told me about, you know, why it is we do what we do, and it's it's not to feel good, it's not to look good, it's not to sound good up at the podium. It's not, a, you know, what I mean, like. You're a bunch of alcoholics, too. I don't know why I need to feel nervous about what you think of me or how good I sound or what you think of my sobriety. You know, it's really maybe. And that's what I prayed before I walked in the door. Like, God, speak through me and not from me. And maybe I could help somebody. That's really what all it is, what we do here, you know, at least what I do here. Um, and so that was a really big shift from, for me and to, like, incorporate the spiritual principles on a deeper level into my life and to help me be rid more and more of um, my, this self-centeredness that I had. Um, you know, and I was, uh, yeah, I was part of a really strong group. Um, it was funny, actually. Jamie texted me. She's like, so, yeah, 630 meeting, no cursing and nice attire. And I was like, oh, right. Um, I, cause I, and I used to do this, right. And dress nice. And I don't, I can tell you, this is probably the nicest thing. I don't have nice clothes anymore. So it's, you got what uh, my best, this is it. Um, yeah, I have, I have three little kids, right. My oldest just turned three. And so I, if I'm not covered with something or spit up or whatever, you know, I picked it up at Goodwill and I put it on and here I am. And, um, <laughs> So, but I was like, oh yeah, that was, and that was a really great time in my recovery, and I was very much involved. Um, uh, but um, I've, yeah, my recovery doesn't look like that today anymore. Um, as far as uh, you know, the night, like the structured tightness of the meeting. I was gonna say when I first got up here, like now that I have a captive audience, right? I want to talk about, you know, how hard it is to be a mom, right? You ever go to those meetings and you're really looking for a solid message of AA? And you're like, oh, man, like, you didn't hear anything about alcoholism, you know? And I'm like, you know, and, and in fact, that's how I got involved in some of the meetings back in New York is, you know, I like, I, I was looking for a strong message of AA. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so that woman helped me tremendously at that point of in my recovery when I was about five years sober. Um, and then the other thing that I heard that I think is um, important, I think I've sh I'm, I'm sure I've shared all this stuff before. It's not nothing's new, and I'm sure you guys have heard it. But um, this one um, man, I had heard him say, it's not what I don't know that will kill me. It's what I do know that's just not so. And that, uh, for me... Um, you know, again, this is just a couple of years ago, I started looking at that principle going, oh, yeah, you know, I've been sober for a decade now. I've looked at a lot of stuff. Am I continuing to grow? What, you know, what am I doing here that's helping to enlighten and mature my spiritual program, you know? And and so I found, he, you know, I heard him share that, and it it struck me, you know, as to what it is, because I'm quite certain I know a lot of things. Um, based on my experience, what other people have told me, you know. Um, and then I, you know, that man made me ask myself that question, like, oh, what, what is it, you know? It, do, am I functioning on a belief system that still works for me? Is it still true? You know, and I think ideally as we grow in recovery, so do our belief systems, you know. I can tell you that the God that I had initially found and developed a relationship with when I was one, two, five years sober is much different than the God that I have now. Um in my life, and it, exp sober experience has has shaped and, and formed that. And um, 
you know, I can't say, um, t you know, today, I'd be lying if I, like, gave you the list of, ever, you know, things, the five basics I do for my recovery, like I used to, because I don't, you know, in fact, um, my, my program um, right now, you know, and the women in my life are like, take it easy on yourself, or you're doing okay, I, I mean, I, I'm so afraid, I, I, I'm not afraid, I, I miss AA is the thing, right? I miss the, the tight fellowship. I miss being able to go to six meetings a week like I used to, um, uh, to have f 10 minutes to myself to meditate. Like, I don't really get that stuff anymore ever, right? Like, the other day I was like, well, I haven't showered in three days, you know? Uh, yikes. I mean, if anything, I qual I know. I'm just being honest, right? I should, if anything, I totally qualify for Al-Anon. I mean, like, I cannot take care of my, there's basics I cannot take care of myself with. And so I, those of you that are laughing, I know I've experienced it, right? I, like, I'll go all day. I haven't eaten, you know? And um, so there's a lot of a lot of things that, um of course, I need to work on. There's a lot of things, though, I also do right. You know, I still um, stay connected to women um, via the phone. I go. I definitely do my best to make my home group every every week. Um, you know, my form of meditation, which I've never really sat down. I've never been really the person to sit down and really meditate. I have for periods of my life. Um, but um, it's more of like, you know, this uh, an ongoing practice, whether I'm doing dishes or lawn, or, you know, there's kids screaming or whatever. It's trying to find the peace within the insanity, really. Um, but I can, I do know, and I've been around AA long enough where I've, and I've heard the stories. Oh, yeah, I had, you know, fill in the blank. I've had so many years. I stopped going to meetings, you know, and I eventually drank. And I know that that's what happens. The insanity of alcoholism returns. And we buy into the lie, right? I mean, I can have a drink, sure, you know. Um, or for me, the big one is, oh, I was so young, it was probably just a phase, you know. Um, and I can tell you that, um, like standing up here, I can tell you I know that it wasn't a phase that I was in. I was a real alcoholic through and through. Um, and I did try very hard to drink normally, um, like a nice girl, and I couldn't. <laughs> and so... Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, and it's not that I'm, I don't want to say fear keeps me sober or fear, it kind of keeps me in line because I don't think it's fear of drinking. It's that, like, I really do want the, the, the beauty that the program offers, you know. I really, I want to be in it because I want to, you know, serve the people in my family and AA and the community around me. Um, and AA is the avenue to which that, that it's the vessel that makes that possible for me. You know, um, and if I stop going to meetings and, you know, fall off the spiritual principles, um, you know, I may not drink tomorrow and I may not drink next week. I have, I would probably be one of those people that goes years without a drink and is just absolutely miserable, you know. Or, gosh, when I was sober, there was um, Suitcase Sally, they called her. She had 18 years sober and she jumped off the bridge. And I remember that guy, Russ, right? I remember going, what? What? What Russ? What happened to her? You know, and he's like, "Oh, honey, she felt she stopped going to meetings." You know, she may have suffered from other things, but she wasn't working her program. You know, she didn't drink. You know, you don't have to actively drink to die from alcoholism. And I thought, man, you know, I don't. Um, I so I've heard it. I've ex I've seen it happen right in front of me. You know, I don't want that to be the case. I'm always kind of have this red flag up. You know, my. You know, what am I doing for my recovery today, you know, and um, am I working to grow towards God, you know, or am I, like, trying to micromanage my life? And so, yeah, some days I'm better at it than others, I can tell you. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know um, how much more I have to say. I'm, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm, I feel really honored to be still sober today. You know, I'm coming up on 13 years. I'm almost, I'm 33 years old, and um, I've never had a legal drink. You know, I have a full, enriching life today. You know, kids hanging off me and sucking on me, and they're everywhere, right? They're little, and they need me, and I'm there for them, you know, and, and that's amazing. And my relationship and all of it is, uh, it's very fulfilling. You know, it's definitely, um, you know, I have a professional life that I'm not engaged in right now because I'm busy, you know, raising my family. And um, 
I can tell you that um, I was an ER trauma nurse for years, working like 80 hours a week before I met my partner and uh, had a family. And I would, I would, I would take that in a heartbeat. I mean, it, that what I do right now is hard work. You know, what I used to do in the ER was really hard work. But what I do, it's just relentless. You know, um, all of them, they're all relentless, <laughs> and it's beautiful. But it's, um, I gotta tell you, like. Oh yeah, you got to keep your sobriety first, sobriety God first, you know, and um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for letting me share, I'm grateful to be here. Hi, I'm an alcoholic, my name is Barbara. Barbara. Thanks, Julie, for asking me to talk, um, and thank you everybody for showing up, although I was, it was less terrifying when there were only three people here, but... Um, um, so, um, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I started drinking um, when I was about, well, let's see, I started, um, I started taking drugs when I was 12, and I bring it in that way because before I even took a drink, I was learning how to lead a double life, and um, in my situation at home, um, my father had died of alcoholism when I was like eight, and um, my older brothers and sisters, which I had a lot of them, I'm sort of the opposite case, um, brought illicit substances into our home, and we were actually selling them. And that's, that was my kind of introduction to the world of drugs and alcohol. And so before I even took a drink, I was um, learning how to present a certain way and have something else entirely going on in the background. And... And, and then I took my first drink at, at probably 13, and um, uh, I took to it like this. It was like I loved the way drugs and alcohol made me feel. And, and my personal experience with drugs was only to bolster up my drinking. You know, so I would take like a little bit of LSD and then drink all night or like a whole bunch of amphetamines so I could drink all night, like someone else was saying. And... Um, but also in my case, um, I, uh, I'm really alcoholic. I'm, I'm seriously alcoholic and, and, uh, and came into that really young so that before I was even into high school, I was having a lot of trouble from drinking. Um, so I really liked the way it made me feel, but I didn't like having an alcoholic seizure. You know, um, that wasn't so much fun. In fact, when you're 15 and it happens, it's like, whoa, that's not cool. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the only thing I wanted to be when I was 15 was cool. And uh, it's, that's really not cool. Um, so I thought it was the pot, you know. So I was like, I gave up pot when I was 15, you know, in ninth grade. Um, uh, so, and I was thinking about how people talk about feeling different, you know, and, and how when I was a kid, I didn't, I don't remember feeling different. I, you know, I felt like a regular kid, although I did smoke cigarettes really young. I did steal. So even though I didn't feel different, I was already, like, acting out and doing things. And, but once I put alcohol and drugs into my system, I started to feel differently. I started to feel like I was different than other people. And um, I also, uh, this is just part of my story. Um, I had a Spanish teacher in junior high school, and she was taking student trips to Mexico. So I started to go on these student trips to Mexico with my Spanish teacher. I did that twice, two summers in a row. And, um, and that also added to my feeling like I was different, like I knew things that other kids didn't know. And, and um, you know, so a whole lot of stuff added to my feeling like and thinking that I was different than other people and, and special somehow. I had, like, special knowledge or something. And... Um, but I was so special that I almost didn't finish high school. You know, it's like when I, um, all I wanted to do by the time I was into high school was drink and use drugs. And, um, um, and that's what I did. And so I, I barely finished. Um, by the time I, uh, but I, so I was, I was very alcoholic before I got through high school. Um, and so it's interesting in Alcoholics Anonymous because we are all so different. You know, we have such different stories. And that's one of the things I love is that um, I'll meet people who, you know, just drank socially for years. And that's just not my story. It's not the way I drink. Um, 
when I drink, that's all that's going on, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and so, like, even before, you know, when I, I remember going camping with a boyfriend when I was, like, 17 and, you know, wetting the, <laughs> the uh, sleeping bag, you know, and, um, and I had the kind of boyfriend that would, like, go and hang it up and, and, and say, oh, you know, everybody does that when they drink too much, you know. <laughs> and, you know, no, they don't, actually, you know. Um, in fact, my girlfriend, I have a friend who, um, she, uh, she went out drinking her first time, you know, drank all night, had a blackout, woke up with someone she didn't know, and she was horrified, and she never did that again. <laughs> you know, she never did that again. It's 40 years later. She's not ever done it again, and um, she's not a dry drunk. Uh, you know, she's just not a, so people do have blackouts that aren't alcoholics, but not as many as I had, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, I mean, so because of that, my drinking story is fairly short, you know. It's like I, um, it just didn't work. It didn't work for me. I, they, did, they weren't giving DUIs in those days to women, apparently, because I got pulled over a lot. And, um, you know, they would go get somebody to drive me home. And uh, I know I would be I would be one of those jail gals that we visit now in jail. You know that would be me. Um, so I don't know if I'm fortunate or not. But um, a girlfriend twelve stepped me in a way. Um, she was going to AA. She was still smoking dope, but she was going to AA, and uh, she was worried about me. She was afraid that I was going to die because I used to drink and drive a lot, and I and I got in wrecks. And um, I mean one. Uh, one wreck I got in, I, I woke up in my car, and I was in the driveway of my mom's house, so I'd gotten the car home somehow, but the car was smashed, and my, my face was smashed, because I had hit the steering wheel, and I had, like, two black eyes the next day, because that's what happens when you have that kind of impact, and, um, and my boyfriend was, like, knocking on the windows, like, what happened, what happened, and, you know, we never found what it was that I hit, um, and, you know, I took all the ways that I could have gone. I mean, that's way more than a whiskey dent, you know what I mean? It's like the car was totaled. And, um, uh, you know, and so my friend was afraid that I was going to die. And so she came, and she had been drinking. She knew what it was like, and I knew she knew. And so she asked me if I would quit drinking. She said, I don't want to see you die, you know. And she asked me if I would quit drinking, and I told her I would. I said I'd give it my best shot. And I did. I quit. I quit. You know, I wanted to, I had some ideas about some things I wanted to do. I wanted to get my life back together. I wanted to go back to school. I had some, I had some ambition and, um, and I did, I quit, I quit drinking and, um, you know, went to AA, didn't, didn't like AA, didn't want, I mean, I was, I think 24 at that time, 23 or 24. And, um, but I have to say at the end of my drinking before that happened, um, I, you know, I had gotten to a place where I was drinking to get through the night. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and my, I'd be all sweating and, and my teeth would be clenched and, and I had to drink to get through the night. And, and that's where my drinking got me. And I was like, and I couldn't work. It's like I tried to even do telephone soliciting and I couldn't stand being in the little booths, you know? It's like I was just like, Ugh. And, uh, you know, and I was like 23. I was unemployable. And so when she said, you know, would you quit drinking, it was, uh, you know, even I could tell I shouldn't drink, you know. Um, so I did. I quit drinking. I ended up um, leaving Seattle. I'm from Seattle. I ended up going to uh, uh, Marin County, California to go to a little college there in San Rafael and um, that would take – I was going to go to Mexico and study. That's what I wanted to do. And um, so I was this roaring dry drunk, and I didn't even know what that – I didn't. I had never heard that term. But um, I did use some recreational drugs during that time too. Um, because I could not stand living in my head. I could not stand it. And this is the piece I didn't know about alcoholism, and, and is that, you know, when I learned finally when I got back here, is that if, if we're alcoholic, that I'm not going to be able to prevent myself from taking that drink. You know, the day is going to come. And, and somebody had said that in an AA meeting, this old timer had said, you know, if you're alcoholic, if you have an alcoholic mind, the day will come when your thinking will lie to you and will tell you that you can control it. And that's what happened to me. Um, I did, you know, I followed that path. I, I did go to Mexico and study. Um, but I got there, and I was like, I had no idea what I was doing there. 
And, and, and this is the thing, too, about my alcoholism, is that I don't have to drink for my alcoholism to progress. And the way that I understand that now is that my mental health <laughs> goes down, as Bill Wilson calls it, goes down like a ski slope or something like that. You know, that's what happens to me, you know, without a drink even in me. It's like my mental health, need, I, I need this, I'm one of these alcoholics that needs the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so uh, long story short, I ended up drinking again down there. Um, and um, it's funny because when I, when I went to drink, uh, I was around people, no one had seen me drink because it had been uh, two years since I'd had any alcohol in me. And uh, I had said to this one gal who was a friend, I said, you know, if you ever see me go for a drink, you tell me, Barbara, don't forget you're alcoholic, you know. And so uh, I had this totally enabling friend. She saw me. We, we, all the students from the different villages went to this, got together for this reunion at this, uh, and had a party. And there was, you know, tequila there which was, of course, one of my favorites, right? Um, and the, a bottle got put in front of me, and I was like, you know, the, you know, all my history of alcoholism, all, you know, I never think, when I go, when, I've, when I say that is what I want as an alcoholic, I never think, you know, incontinence tonight, you know? <laughs> it's like, I never think seizure tomorrow, you know, uh, I always, always think this is a good idea. This is a good idea. That's what I, that's what alcohol says to me, no matter what has happened in the past. And that's what happened that night. And she saw me going for this bottle and she's like, Barbara, Barbara, don't forget you're alcoholic. And I like, without even thinking, I conned her. I was like, what, you won't like me if I drink? And she's like, oh no, no, I didn't mean that. And I was like, oh, you know out of the way because, you know, it's like no human power, right, you know, and, uh, and I was like, G -g -g -g, you know, it's like I just couldn't get enough, and um, I mean, I basically had a nervous breakdown in this little village I was at, I just was like crying, and, and what I remembered later, too, was that, you know, I was, I was a not a believer in, in God or anything, I didn't believe that there was a God, or I didn't believe, I don't know what, but when I was in this little village and I was having this meltdown, I actually prayed. And I said, you know, God, if there's anything out there, please help me. And, and um, now it just so happens that I drank again after that. And I think that I wouldn't have found out what my problem is if had I not drank. So, you know, maybe that was like God with the two by four. You know, like they say, you know, sometimes they'll say, God has to, you know, get our attention before, you know, his will can be whatever. You know, I don't know how that works exactly. But, um, but I did drink again after not drinking for two years and, uh, you know, what I woke up to the next morning was, was really ugly, and I'm not going to go into it, um, but it was something, it was a yet, and uh, it, which is, you know, it hasn't happened yet to you, you know. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go into it, but, um, uh, but then, and I shook for like four days, and then there was another party, and I thought, oh, okay, la last time I got drunk, this time I'm only going to have four drinks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've never said I just have one drink unless it was a double or a triple, you know. Um, so uh, I'll just have four drinks. And I did. I had four drinks. And I was like, okay, that's all I'm going to have. And uh, see, I can control it. And then at that moment, I remembered what this guy had said in AA. He had said, if you're alcoholic, if you have an alcoholic mind, the day will come when your thinking will lie to you and will tell you you can control it. And, um, and I realized that that had just happened. I had just had that very thought. And I was like... Oh my God, it's like I, it was like this moment, it was my moment of clarity when I realized that I was not going to be able to do this. I was not going to be able to stay sober and I was going to go back to that life that I had left, that I had left. I had left it, you know, far behind, I thought. And uh, it, it scared the hell out of me. It really did. Um, and so I came to AA. Um, I, I thought, you know, I wonder what it would be like to get off everything, everything. And, um, and I came to AA, and it was in uh, San Rafael, California. And, um, I mean, I had been a little, I had been an, uh, on the outskirts of society since I was a kid, you know, when I'd been stealing. Um, you know, I'd been hanging out, you know, selling drugs, and then I'd been hanging out with, I had two boyfriends in a row with Harley Davidson, so I was on the back of, you know, motorcycles and motorcycle stuff. And, 
and then I was in these sort of radical political stuff that I won't go into, but um, I was always on this outskirts of society. And so here I am in Marin County, California, which looks really straight, let me tell you. You know, it's not San Francisco. Um, and I was like, there's nothing, I don't have anything in common with these people. You know, it's like AA scared the hell out of me. I was just so, I was so, you know, about presenting and having something else going on inside, I just was like, I was, I was just a wreck kind of inside. And, and, um, but I was desperate. I was desperate. And so I'd go to these meetings and, um, and, you know, there, and I was not the huggable newcomer, you know, I was like, you know, um, and there was this one guy, this one big old, this not, he wasn't old, but he was this big guy, really slow guy. And he, and my first commitment was setting up at a, a speaker meeting because I could, I, I could, st you know, people wouldn't approach the newcomer because they were too busy looking good, you know, and talking to their friends and stuff. So I would go to that meeting and set up the chairs. And, but this one guy was like, you just keep coming back. You know, that was the closest I could get to somebody hugging me, you know, was patting me on the shoulder. And, you know, I'll always be grateful to that guy. But so I ended up getting a sponsor. This one woman saw that I needed something and she got her friend to sponsor me. And, um, and I asked her to sponsor me, and um, and I didn't particularly like this woman, you know. I mean, she was just like this housewife in Nevada, as far as I was concerned. She drank a little too much wine, and uh, you know, but she had the steps and she had sobriety, and so she had something. She had something that she could help me with, and and we were. I worked the steps with her, and and um, and I feel like I owe her my life for that, you know, because it changed my life. Um, I was one of those people that I came into AA and didn't like it. I mean, even though I had been desperate and had all this bad stuff happen, I didn't like AA. But you know what? I didn't like not AA <laughs> either. You know, it's like I, I didn't like people in AA, but I didn't like people outside of AA. You know, I just didn't like people. That's what I thought. You know, that's what I thought. That's the way I thought I was. You know, I'm just that kind of person, right? But the truth of it is that I was carrying that around. I was carrying that that you know, that, that attitude and that difference and, and all that stuff, I was the one with that problem. And when I worked the, I worked the steps and, and, um, I remember this experience. Um, I was sitting in this meeting and, um, I think I was maybe on step seven or something and, um, or I had worked seven steps and I looked around the room and everybody in the room just appeared beautiful to me. It's like, I felt like this spark of God was in each person, and I'm not a religious, a religious person, but it's like I just fell in love with people, and I was like, but even I could see something had changed, you know, it's like, it's like, whoa, you know, it, it, it is possible to change from the inside out, you know, and so then I, I came up, and I did all my uh, amends up in Seattle, and um, made amends to that, you know, the boyfriend who had to rescue me from the bikers because I had wrecked the woman's car because I was driving drunk. And anyway, just all the people that, that I had, all the wreckage from my past. And, um, and, uh, and when I had done that, when I had worked the ninth step, I felt like me and life were even now. And now from now forward, from here forward is a new day. You know, it's a new life. And, and so that was, um, Oh, I didn't say, yeah, I guess my sobriety is, uh, was April 1st, 1984. So I've been sober 31 years this month. And, um, and my home group is the Empire Way group. Um, so I've been sober longer now than I had been alive when I got sober. <laughs> I was 26 when I got sober. Um, but so a lot's happened in, in uh, 31 years. I mean, I feel like I've lived, you know, four different lives at least, you know. Um, I remember when um, uh, we were sharing driving over here, um, you know, I, I grew up in a family of, with lots of lesbians in them, you know, and in Seattle. So I grew up kind of looking like I, I was so I got sober in Marin County where everybody's really straight. And I said to my girlfriend, well, so why aren't guys asking me out? And she said, well, do you really want to know, you know, because, uh, you know, you know, blah, 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 you know, it's like I had, I have short hair again, but I did then too, and, uh, you know, wore men's coat, men's clothing and buttons and, you know, eat the rich and, uh, you know, uh, whatever, you know, something angry, and, um, 
uh, and I was like, really? So it's like I went through this, like, oh, you know, as I started perming my hair, and I don't hear wearing, you know, it's like I started, oh, I need to put out the social markers, you know, and, um, but so anyway, now I can, now I have that option, I guess, but, um, uh, you know, and so things change, you know, it's like things change, and so um, one of the things that uh, I've been able to do, it's like all the stuff that I wanted to do before I got sober, I've done sober, you know, I've done, and I, and I, and I believe that, it's like I believe that all of our dreams, whatever it is that we would want, you know, I can do, we can do sober, um, I, and even things we never would have guessed, you know, it's like, um, I, uh, I want, I was into speaking Spanish and, and Latin America and stuff, and I, and so I decided to take some Spanish, uh, in sobriety, and I ended up, um, with a degree in Spanish, and then, but then I was having trouble with the grammar, so I decided to, uh, start dancing salsa, because it was uh, a way to learn Spanish, you know, with my body or something. I don't know what I was thinking. But anyway, so I went through like 10 years of uh, ten years of that in sobriety. And it was the greatest thing, you know. It's like going out with friends and stuff, and they would be drinking. And it's like it was no, you know, it was no big deal for me. And what I, was find, what I would find is that I, you can, I can practice the principles anywhere we are, you know. Like, like I would be nervous because I wasn't the greatest dancer. I mean, come on, you know, I didn't grow up doing it. And um and I'm Norwegian, for God's sake, you know. I'm like, what are you doing so close, you know? Um, <laughs> right, you know. It was a culture shock, you know. It's like, but it was also really good for me, I think, you know. But, um, uh, but so anyway, but so like I'd be nervous, you know. Like I'd be sitting there and have my boyfriend or whatever, and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do this, and I'd be like, oh yeah, the fear prayer, you know. And I would do, I would do the do an AA practice the principles, like, oh, you know, take this fear from me and show me instead what you would have me be. And then I'd be able to go out and have a good time, you know. Um, I've been able to study abroad again, and, and uh, I went to, um, I, I decided to immerse in Spanish in Bolivia, of all places, and, um, and I went there, and uh, I was feeling apart from, because, I, again, I don't need a drink to feel apart from, right? And, um, and I ended up going to an AA meeting, and this, uh, this guy, there was a guy in the meeting there, and, uh, you know, he didn't have some of his teeth, and his nose was all, like, obviously had been hit a few times. And, uh, and I thought, oh, he's a newcomer. He's off the streets, right? You know, and so I shared that I was new to the area and feeling weird. And, and uh, this guy comes up afterwards, and it turns out he has two years. But, you know, there's a lot of poverty there, so people don't have health care. You know, it's like, so he hadn't gotten this stuff fixed. But so anyway, he had two years, and he walked me around the whole town of La Paz, and introduced me to all these women, like street vendors and stuff, that were in the program. Were these women that I would never have known that they were in the program, and they all had cell phones, and they're like, "Oh, uh, like I had 17 years sobriety. Oh, you have a 17? Can I have your phone number? You know?" And and uh, and so I ended up sponsoring women there, and uh, you know, and and I I joke about it because uh, you know my Spanish hadn't been good enough up until then that I could I tried to sponsor people here in Spanish, and it was I wasn't very successful. So anyway, I always say, you know. I'll find someone desperate enough who, want, who wants what I have, you know. And so I had to go to the mountaintop in Bolivia, and there were women there that hadn't, there were no women with time that had worked the steps, you know. And they were like, whoa, you know. And so we would go off on these trips, and I would give them their homework, and, and they ended up working the steps while I, while I was there. And then I went back five years later to, to work there briefly, and they were still there, and they were trying to carry the message to others. And, and uh, so there's this fellowship there that is, you know, so anyway, um, and other adventures, right? You know, it's just like, there's just a lot. I mean, there's just more to my life and sobriety than I ever, I mean, as I, when I drank, my world, like everybody's got smaller and smaller, you know, there were fewer things that I could do without a drink. And finally, nothing, I couldn't do anything even with a drink. Um, I remember thinking, wow, you know, I'm drinking, but going to the movies, I'm drinking, you know, it's like, how hard is that? Right. You know? Um, but, uh, so, um, most recently I, I want to share this because, um, uh, so it took me a long time to become willing to get married in sobriety. <laughs> um, so I got married in 2012 and, um, uh, about a, and, and I moved out of state with this guy. Um, we went to rural New York state and, um, and a year later he got sick and then six months later he died. And, um, and so I moved back to Seattle um, last summer, and uh, this last week I just cel just celebrated. Just uh, there was a year anniversary of his death, 
And so, I mean, I share that because, um, you know, in sobriety, anything can happen. I mean, life happens, stuff happens. And, you know, I, there have been times in this last two years that I've, I thought that my feelings were trying to kill me. <laughs> you know, and I, I've kind of thought that at other times in sobriety. It's not that I ever wanted to drink. I didn't want to drink. And, and I can say that, you know, for the most part, I, I haven't wanted to drink in sobriety. But developing the capacity to feel feelings and tolerate them, you know, to just tolerate difficult feelings is a huge thing, I think, for alcoholics. Um, and uh, so let's see, what else was I going to say about that? Oh, I guess, um, and in fact, I mean, I, I, felt, I felt like I, I'd gotten really invested in that relationship. <laughs> Damn him. Um, and, uh, and it really took me sideways. It really put me sideways. And, um, and so when I got back to Seattle, um, I started working with this other, with this new woman in sobriety. And, um, and she, uh, she got me doing things that were really uncomfortable. I, 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 but it was like, it's just old time AA stuff. You know, she had me going to a lot of meetings. I wasn't working at that time, and she had me going to five meetings a week and, um, and reaching out a lot to newcomers. And here I was grieving, seriously grieving, and she wanted me to go to meetings, get the phone numbers of women, and call them. I was like, seriously? It's like the first week I didn't do it, and then after that I did. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you know what? It's like, it totally worked. You know, it's not to say that I didn't have grief or that I don't even now have grief. But um, practicing the principles in AA, in Alcoholics Anonymous, allows me to not just get through difficult times, but have a whole different experience of them. You know, when my husband was sick in the hospital, we had managed to start a jail meeting in the county where I was. And me and this other woman, and a lot of times it was just me, every Sunday I went to that jail meeting. And no matter what else was going on, that I went there. And, um, you know, that was sometimes, I mean, I would walk out of that jail meeting and I knew that no matter what else happened, I was going to be all right. And there's just no way I can get there on my own. You know, on my own, where I go is... <laughs> It's doomsday. <laughs> you know, it's like I might as well just get under the covers now and not get out of bed because nothing's going to get better. And that's, that's where I go. And, um, and that's just not the case. I mean, so anyway, uh, and the other thing that I would say is that um, as, as gregarious as I like to think I am, you know, I, I'm still, I'm a person that will isolate if given the chance. I just, that's the where I go. And, and when I'm involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's not possible. It's like I have, to, I have to let you guys in. I have to let you know what's going on to save my life. And it's like that, it was like that one with my first sponsor. It's like I sat down. I remember I, with my first sponsor, I, I met her for coffee. And this woman was talking to me and telling me her story. And I was thinking that I'm going to have to start telling this woman the truth. And it's not that I'd necessarily even been lying. I just hadn't been talking about what was going on for me, and I didn't have any idea how to do that. I didn't know how to talk to people. And I, and I knew that I needed to, talk, to start telling this woman the truth to save my life. And, and that's the way that I look at it now. That's the way that I look at sponsorship. That's the way I, that I look at, at um, my relationship with a sponsor. Is like I have to be willing to tell her the truth. I have to be willing to tell her whatever it is that I don't want to say, whatever it is that I've been thinking or doing that I don't want to talk about, that's the very thing I need to talk to her about. And, um, and what I have found is that it's an amazing, it's an amazing journey. It's an amazing life. And, and so even though difficult things have happened, and that's not the only thing that's happened in this, in this time, in this 31 years, I've lost a lot of family members, um, and other things, other difficult things. But, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, you know, no matter what, it's like I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't. Um, I feel so grateful to have gotten sober 
in AA because if I weren't in AA, I wouldn't have this option, these options, this way to call newcomers, you know, to be told by someone to go to meetings and call newcomers. I have an, a girlfriend who has a, a, a similar experience with losing her husband, a, a new husband, and she doesn't have the program. And, you know, I just, if I didn't have the program, I, I just don't think I'd be in the shape that I'm in now. That's for sure. Um, not that it's all, you know, sunshine and roses, <laughs> you know, um, but I just, so I just moved to Everett. I just got a job in Everett and I moved up there and um, I got my own place. And, and you know, even though um, I just passed this difficult milestone of my husband, the, my, the anniversary of my husband's death, um, you know, the other day I, I felt like, I thought, you know, I feel kind of happy. You know, I feel happy. And and it's not, again, it's not that I never feel grief, but, you know, it's like to be able to can, to hold both of those feelings at once is, is a, it's an amazing thing, to be able to have some emotional complexity, to not be just angry or just sad or just happy, you know, but to be able to say, you know what, there's all this going on at once, and it's, that's okay. I mean, that's actually what real life is like. It's not just, you know, black and white and, and easily defined. I mean, life is complex, and um, but it's amazing how we want to throw our lives away, how easily as alcoholics we will say, you know, I don't want to stop. I was, didn't want to stop drinking, you know, even though it was killing me. It's like that, how what, we don't even know what we're throwing away, and, and there's just so much more here. You know, there's so much more to life that I, than I could even imagine, you know, um, but because again, my life's got, my life had gotten very small. So anyway, if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, or even if you're not, and if you're having a difficult time, um, I just want to welcome you and, and really encourage you to stay. And even if things are tough, you know, to stay. And, um, I think that's all I have to say. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.